please, in principle, because maybe this will happen, <laughs> really, uh, please to introduce Professor Ellery Engel from the uh, School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta. So uh, Ellery, as you, many of you may know, if you study, well, first of all, let me tell you what he did. He came through uh, Yale University. Many of you know that uh, during the uh, 70s and 80s. The golden uh, days of Yale. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> there was like a super group of graduate students. And he was one of them. all do modesty. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> really. By super group, I mean they, the interactions were fantastic and people were, uh, you know, self, you know, really stimulating one another. And uh, we had names like Doc Canfield came out of there. And of course, uh, Ellery and Tim Lyons, many of you may know these names if you study uh, biogeochemical cycling of one sort or another. So Ellery in particular uh, made his name, I think uh, it's safe to say, in the area of phosphorus chemistry, all about phosphorus and its geologic record of storage and cycling during the last 500 million years and in the modern ocean as well and in the atmosphere. Some of you heard yesterday he gave a special seminar on aerosol uh, chemistry of, of phosphorus and iron. He pioneered a number of things in the area of phosphorus chemistry. Uh, for example, the use of uh, P31 NMR to study uh, organic phosphorus compounds, their generation, their form. He just used the synchrotron techniques. You'll hear some of about that today. I think he's uh, largely responsible for the recognition of polyphosphate chemistry in sediments. Uh, so that opened up a whole new uh, area of study of the cycling of phosphorus. He's looked at the, uh, the role of the redox conditions in the water column on phosphorus cycling, and uh, but not just phosphorus, nitrogen as well, and uh, a variety of other uh, elements. So. Uh, he started uh, his professional career after he left uh, uh, Yale. He went to Skidaway Institute of Oceanography, where he was a postdoc. Then he went to Port Aransas, UT, uh, University of Texas at Austin, where he was uh, for a number of years. And about 15 years ago, he went to Georgia Tech, where he used to remain, and been a key figure there uh, since. He's, uh, in addition to his research and, and normal duties, he's a director of teaching effectiveness at the, in the school uh, there at Georgia Tech. So uh, it's going to talk about P today. It, it started out with phosphorus, as I was saying, and P in the C. And, uh, but I think there's some other P you're going to talk about. Penguins, too, right? A little bit? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes, there you go. <laughs> so uh, welcome. Thank you for coming. Thanks, thanks. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Thank you all. It's really been a thrill to uh, be here and uh, hear all about all the exciting research that's uh, been that's going on here. I've been really have been having an incredibly enjoyable visit. So I thank you so much. So a few years ago, I had the opportunity to go down to the Antarctic, and it was actually a a, pro, a, a grant motivated by phosphorus. And uh, which was unique in itself because phosphorus is not a limiting nutrient in the Antarctic. There's plenty of it in the water. Um, and so, you know, why would you want to study it there? We had some good reasons of looking at phosphorus transport for the water column and realizing there were some processes that are really moving it. But what we found is this is a little bit of a, today's talk be an example of scientific serendipity. While we were looking for one thing we found something else that I think hopefully you'll find as interesting as we did. So, so we went down there um, on a Swedish icebreaker uh, for several years. For actually quite a long time, the U.S. Does not, did not have uh, a single heavy icebreaker um, capable of breaking the ice that, uh, into the big base there at McMurdo Station. And for the last, I don't know, at least decade, there's been ice there in the summer that's prevented the supply ships from going into the McMurdo base and resupplying them. And having just spent a few days at the McMurdo base, and you can see in the store, I think people can buy two six packs of beer a day, and they do. <laughs> and so I think that ship mostly carries beer. So you can imagine the importance. So they, they need to break the ice, and uh, so the, for a few years they hired the Swedes to drive 
this ship down from Sweden to break about, I don't know, 15, 20 miles of ice so the fuel and supply of your ship could get into McMurdo. So, um, but they thought, well, you know, while they're, you know, paying $8 million for the Swedes to drive the ship down there, maybe a little bit of science could be done along the way. This is, this ship, you'll notice it's, it's a little bit weird in design that the, the front end, that's a technical ship term, um, <laughs> is much wider than the back end. So this thing breaks ice by just ramping up on the ice and the weight of the ship breaks the ice. So we had uh, an unusual science requirement. It wasn't, there was a certain amount of time, but the science was allotted about a little over 400 tons of fuel. Otherwise, the ship would have been too light to break the ice. This ship in open water burned 20 tons of fuel a day just to move this ship. When it's in ice, if it was heavy ice, it could uh, burn up to 80 tons of fuel. Science then was allotted. So as such, the science was, there was a lot of people looking at fluxes from the ice, some people doing animal studies, as you'll see. And um, so we would go and uh, break a hole in the ice often where there wasn't one, and then the ship would stay there for a day or two while uh, people did experiments on the ice, or uh, you know, we did some water column profiles. So I was doing a lot of water column work. So this ship would be moving around, and then uh, you can see it's anchored to the ice here. So I thought, you know, it's Friday afternoon, sure, long week. You know, the best way to wake up a class I have found is with a pop quiz. So we're going to have a little ecosystem appreciation quiz right now. <laughs> so we have our, our ship here, and we have, of course, charismatic macrofauna here. Um, they're just, you know, they're just so fun to watch on land. You cannot help but smile when you uh, see these penguins, uh, these uh, Adelie penguins. Just, and they're so curious. They come running up to you and say, ooh, what, what are you? You know, and so this, this was something that was just totally fun. I was bunked up with a teacher at sea, and he brought a camera that he could put on a wire. And it was waterproof. We could put it down in the water. And we had this hole in front of the ship that, you know, wasn't there. So the penguins said, lunchtime. And they're coming from miles around to go for a swim. So this hole in the ice attracted animals. We thought, we just had a camera just dangling in the water. And so this is, you'll see it's a little jumpy, but it's just marvelous. You see them on land, they're kind of funky, you know, not the most graceful animals, but when they're, they're like little torpedoes in the water. And here, I got it in slow-mo, attack of the killer penguin. He's coming in, he's coming in. <laughs> okay. So, he's seeing something shiny, and he's, uh, he's trying to attack it. So. First question of the quiz, what do Adelie penguins mostly eat in the Antarctic? Krill. krill. I, heard, I heard krill. You've got to speak up. So they, they do eat um, krill as the main uh, portion of their diet. Okay, we also had um, researchers looking at the sort of history of canine distemper virus in uh, seals. So. When they, uh, so he's going to trap this seal <laughs> who's just like not as panicked as I would be if I was a seal. And there's a guy with a net, but these guys, they, they trust the seals up. So around, I guess, 1910, they brought dogs to the Antarctic. And the dogs brought canine distemper. And I think about 90% of the seal population was wiped out. And so these are the great grandchildren seals. And so they're looking at the sort of, um, uh, you know, hereditary uh, transfer of immunity um, through these generations. So they trust the seal up with the net and take samples from everywhere. Um, and, and then, you know, I think after this traumatic experience, the this, this seal would like be, you know, a lot of times they'd like, oh, that was weird, and, you know, move about 10 feet and go back to sleep. <laughs> I, I'm glad I'm not a seal in the air, because, yeah. But these are mostly what we uh, found out there were uh, crab eater seals. So second quiz question, what do crab eater seals mostly eat? 
You would think crabs by their name, but they were unfortunately named. They're, they actually eat mostly krill, but people, when they first saw them, their, their, their teeth are this really jagged, horrible looking, sort of very sharp and jagged. And I guess they're designed, they can take a gulp of water and filter it and, and get the, the krill. So crab eater seals, unfortunately named mostly krill. Now krill, if you've seen them, you know, they look like a little shrimp and they're, you know, they, the, the carapace is a little bit reddish. So again, this is a, a, a minky whale. There's several of them that showed up in our, our uh, ship created swimming pool. And, um, you know, they were so close you could smell their breath just leaning over the bow. And uh, he's going to give you a hint of what he's been mostly eating. <laughs> um, that's very, very kind of, uh, of, of this seal. So, um, so we, we can, I, I can maybe answer this while well, he's answered the quiz question that the, this uh, very you know, large animal um, eats mostly krill, which here you have a picture. And then the next question, what do krill mostly eat in the Antarctic? Diatoms. And you probably say that because you can see this sort of brownish area in the diatom showing a little bit of what uh, he had for lunch. And, you know, this is maybe a little with the sunlight filtering too, but again, with the camera, with our, uh, my teacher at sea, we were just squealing with joy. We, we actually had the camera underwater, and the whales went by. We were uh, just a you know, happy bunch. But you'll see, actually, you know, this is maybe not the best view, but a lot of the areas of, of ice um, we have um, brown ice, and so e within brine pockets and such in the ice, there's diatoms. There's also open water diatoms. So here's just a light microscopic view of a typical Carithron genus uh, diatom there, and you can uh, see the uh, sort of photosynthetic bodies within that organism. And another one here, um, maybe. Um, I guess, uh, give me a second. Yeah, it's moving. Um, that, that's very common is the Fragilaria opsis, which, you know, again, a diatom, it looks like to me a, a stack of checkers, you know, sort of colonial uh, kind of thing with just one cell after another stacked up. And so these, these comprise, you know, the main portion of the diet of our um, krill. Krill are the main portion of the diet for all these uh, fun animals to look at. Not that diatoms aren't fun. Um, and of course, they're not animals. But um, so what do diatoms need to grow? Phosphorus. They do need phosphorus. There's plenty. That's such a good answer. Thank you. <laughs> but there, you know, there's plenty of phosphorus. And so the Antarctic e ecosystem, I mean, you know, uh, is classically thought of in, to be pretty much dominantly limited by the availability of iron. So hence, a lot of studies looking at iron cycling in the region. He did really well on the quiz, so um, you all get an A. <laughs> so. So we were down there, like I said, to look at phosphorus, but then we ended up looking at iron. And um, so here is the basic cruise track of where the ship went. And it did, as you can see, by these various sampling locations. These are places where the ship stopped, mostly in the ice, for samples. This was a two-month-long cruise. Um, and uh, started around uh, just after Thanksgiving, where they fueled the ship in Uruguay, and then we got off about two months later. So we got Christmas, New Year's, Santa Lucia Day, <laughs> learned a lot about Swedish culture, <laughs> and um, they have this lovely food item. It's uh, fermented fish, and the cans are bulging uh, because of the and it is the nastiest smelling thing you have ever smelled. But it didn't taste as bad as you would think. But, um, but it was fun to have this sort of cross-cultural um, experience with the Swedes. Um, and, uh, but we, we made many stops. And we're gonna, I'm going to show you just a, a one nutrient profile, sort of just uh, stringing these uh, various stops together, sort of the worst. So we're in the, the shelf, uh, more of a you know, more coastal region of Antarctic. 
and a little bit in from the uh, circumpolar um, ocean. But uh, so, you know, we did our science, and then at this point, now is the time for the ship to really do its business of breaking ice to the McMurdo base, which is around the S in uh, Ross Sea. So we uh, think, you know, why study iron in the Antarctic? Well, you know, I think everybody's probably seen this picture and, and such. You know, there's been a lot of, you know, uh, money. It was that, that John Martin said that, you know, give me a tanker full of iron and I'll give you an ice age or something to that effect. That stimulating productivity, um, what, you know, could affect CO2 cycle. I think, though, you know, there's a lot of problems with that, but it really did drive a lot of really, you know, interesting iron research in the region, including a study where um, a bunch of iron was dumped in the uh, uh, circumpolar ocean, I believe, and um, then a few days later, this um, satellite um, image could show you uh, basically chlorophyll, and you could see a giant bloom was stimulated there. So. There's been a lot of work justified by this, this, this sort of thing. But I think, you know, probably in a, in a bigger sense of, of, of why one would study iron in the Antarctic is that, of course, this is one of those few areas in the world where we form deep water masses. And those deep water masses move throughout the ocean and reappear sometimes many hundreds to thousands of years later, containing nutrients that they gained from processes happening in areas like the Antarctic and where they resurface. So, you know, what happens in the Antarctic does not stay in the Antarctic, if you remember the uh, slogan for Las Vegas, you know, what's, you know, what you do here stays here, you know, but the, this, this kind of thing. So, I think in more of a general sense, it's just understanding um, the process is there, what's moving nutrients like phosphorus, like iron, through the water column, through the sediments, and that sort of thing, does set nutrient ratios for later on uh, down, downstream of the ocean. So one can, uh, uh, this is uh, basically Raymond Sembrato, um, uh, put together a lot of just beautiful nutrient data on the cruise, wonderful person to work with. And you can see here phosphorus, you know, going from low levels here to high levels. These are vertical profiles you can see taken with the CTD um, over sort of the shelf area and then a little bit deeper waters along our, our cruise transect. And you can certainly see that there are processes that remove phosphorus in the surface waters. Still, that's a pretty high level oceanographically, 1.75 micromoles, that's plenty. Um, but it's, there, we definitely see evidence for some process stripping phosphorus quite effectively from surface waters and sending it down deep quite effectively. And that's what attracted us to the area. And that was related to some of our work on polyphosphates. We think, and we have evidence for, uh, in some regions, diatoms, not only accumulating phosphorus in the usual way in their tissue, but also making these uh, bodies that are just almost like a pure glob of phosphate. Uh, polyphosphates of uh, linked up uh, phosphate atoms you know, within their cells. And we, we're seeing this in all sorts of places. And we wanted to look for it in um, the Antarctic um, as part of uh, some of our work. We're also looking at dissolved organic matter in the region as well. So here's, of course, that, that rationale. We make the deep waters here, and then you know they come up in upwelling zones where you get bursts of productivity. And so these waters contain iron, phosphorus, nitrogen, <coughs> that levels that have been set in the Antarctic. So, um, so in a way, what, what we wanted to look at is some of the processes that are moving various elements around uh, the system. And of course, a lot of this elemental movement is coordinated by um, small organisms like diatoms, which um, you know, comprise a major percentage of the, the biomass here. And this, this follows up on some lovely work that started, I think, here with uh, uh, Nick Fisher and uh, uh, Ben Twining and Stephen Baines, where they you know, really started to pioneer looking at organisms with the uh, synchrotron to uh, learn a little bit more about their chemistry. And so um, we um, 
had been doing a lot of work on, on phosphorus, and uh, you know we got interested in, in sort of looking at these diatoms to uh, find uh, polyphosphate bodies um, as a little part of our work. And we did all of our work here at the Argonne National Lab. So you have your nice synchrotron down the road. This one's outside of Chicago um, to characterize uh, what was going on in the cells. And one of the things I, I just and I don't know, it just tickles me. When I go to the synchrotron, you know, you get a limited amount of time, and there's a person in front of you and a person in back of you, and you go, hey, what you working on? And I just find it just amazing the variety of things that people are doing at the synchrotron. So there's folks like me. I, I've been really loving to work on aerosols. They're small. We care about their chemistry. It's a perfect technique, and people aren't using it as much as um, certainly microorganisms, which we were talking about, but, you know, people have looked at defects in computer circuit boards, lots of biological work looking at tissues and neurons, and you think about Alzheimer's, is it aluminum uh, concentrations getting in between the synapses, so a lot of, bi I, there was one beam line where somebody had a chunk of the famous Tyrannosaurus Rex fossil from Chicago, they were um, doing elemental mapping of a little bit of Sue the Tyrannosaurus. <clears throat> I think I talked to the world expert on sea urchin teeth, um, which is, I love this kind of stuff. I mean, somebody's just so excited about understanding sea urchin teeth. I, it's awesome. I love it. And um, one day I was in the lab and I see these green things wiggling around. I'm like, those are tomato worms. And so somebody was uh, studying an adjacent beam line, the respiratory system of tomato hornworms, and trying to image that. And in terms of, well, if you spray pesticides, I guess, how are they they're taking it up? So, you know, wiggling worms, solar cells, concrete, um, looking at stalagmites, protein structure is the big money business there. That's where all the drug companies are putting a lot of things. But a lot of different, this is just a small smattering of just almost the people I have run into doing just a great uh, sort of thing. Um, I imagine most of you are, are, you know, with one down the road familiar, but just as a quick synchrotron review, you have a big circular building that, you know, it, it takes like an argon at a nice uh, walking pace, 15 to 20 minutes to walk completely around the building. So it, it gives you an idea of the scale. And, um, and around that ring is you have a beam of electrons moving around in an evacuated tube at nearly the speed of light. Then those electrons at various spots along the ring, those many of these uh, one uh, device is called an undulator, and it just makes that beam of electrons basically change its momentum. It's a series of magnets, and those electrons move up and down. When they do that and they change the momentum, a consequence of that is they produce very powerful X-rays. They don't like to call it X-rays at the synchrotron because that sounds icky, so they call it light. Um, but you get a lot of uh, X-ray light, a full spectrum, all the different wavelengths. So you got a lot of power, but when you start out with a lot of power, what that allows you to do is to focus that power down with uh, various ways of selecting just one or a, a limited range of wavelengths from that giant flood of power so you get one wavelength, but you still have a lot of power because you started out with the you know, floodgates here. And then you can have one wavelength, which then you can focus and aim at your sample and still have quite a bit of power to um, stimulate and um, characterize some of the elements present in a small particle. So the advantage of the synchrotron is the power that you, know, you get. And so when you do all this focusing and, 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 and wavelength, extraction, you still have something left at the far end. And, you know, basically, process, you put a, a strong x-ray or light in. It has an, um, at just the right level of energy. That x-ray has enough to knock an inner shell electron out of that, uh, you know, K shell or uh, higher shells, but you need a certain amount of energy. Below that, nothing really happens. So different elements have different energies where um, you can knock that inner shell electron out, so that electron exits, um, can interact with surrounding atoms. So here's a more fancy diagram. Light in, electron out, a higher shell, from an M shell, L shell, 
electron drops down to fill the vacancy. And when it does that, it emits a uh, signal we can uh, measure by a fluorescence signal with uh, various detectors. And we can get basically, <clears throat> here's a scale with energy. And you probably can't read them. These are elements sodium, magnesium, silica, calcium, potassium, chromium, zinc, germanium, arsenic, <clears throat> whole range of elements. Each peak is corresponding to the amount uh, present. You can calibrate this uh, under the beam. So we can, in a little spot, characterize what's, uh, what's there, at least um, in terms of uh, the, what elements are present. The, um, <clears throat> The beam is, uh, you know, so that we're typically using is about 300 nanometers, third of a micron, but we have uh, used some systems that the beam can get down to 30 nanometers, a little bit uh, larger than the width of a cell wall. So this is very fine scale stuff in, in many cases. So here's a picture of the uh, inside of the synchrotron. Beam comes down into a, a little metal room protect you from x-rays and um, and so people have used this to all you know um, start to look at a variety of problems so here is a diatom from the Antarctic and like I said we started out this this game saying okay we want to look for phosphorus phosphorus concentrations that didn't work for various reasons but while we we're you know scanning what you can do is you can take our fine beam it's got a basically about a 300 nanometer spot size. And you can just raster it across your sample, or actually you move your sample in front of the beam, and you know, get a, essentially each pixel is a chemical analysis that contains, you know, each pixel you have information on iron, zinc, copper, cobalt, calcium, blah, 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 blah. This whole suite of elements um, for each pixel. And not surprisingly, when you look at the, oh, I guess it's cut off, but this is the silicon, oh, there it is, silicon channel, um, you know, and map a diatom for the concentration of silica. Not surprisingly, it looks like a diatom, because diatoms are made of silica, uh, you know. I'd like to say we discovered that, but uh, we didn't. So we're looking at all the channels here, you know, when we're working away, we have all the different screens. We can see uh, elemental maps of all the elements. Most of them don't look like much because, you know, there's, it, it, there's nothing there. And you know, I was working away with my student, Julia Diaz. Um, I forgot to mention earlier, I think I had a picture of her next to a penguin. Um, maybe that's coming up. Um, and uh, I said, well, why is the iron channel lighting up? Why is the iron? More or less, not as good, but why does that look like a diatom? We're getting a fairly nice looking image of a diatom, but in the iron channel. So that's showing the distribution of iron. So high concentrations of iron or high concentrations of silica are the lighter colors. The background material is, uh, you know, just the darker colors. So it's, you know, the brighter, warmer colors, higher concentrations. Certainly does look like this carithron diatom. So we started looking at the diatoms and then we said, okay, we have the diatoms. The image of that diatom is, um, you know, uh, also mirrored in the iron channel. We also noticed a couple things, these little bright spots, which we called hot spots. So there was also associated in the sample particles really rich in iron. And I'm like, oh, crap. You know, um, you're thinking, you know, you're on a ship. Um, we are not trace metal people. I don't know if any of you have been around trace metal people. You know, we weren't wearing the Teflon underpants and the, the, the whole thing. So, you know, they are, would insane be a, 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 a bad, I mean, they're very careful. That's. Um, to you know, avoid contamination. You are working on a ship made out of iron, and so there are possible sources of contamination, and trace metal people go through enormous lengths to avoid that. So we're thinking, oh god, we've got these obviously bits enriched in iron. Luckily I called up uh, 
been twining, I said, you know, you know and uh, talked to him about this. He says, you know, actually they see it in their samples that they took in the circ circumpolar ocean, and they're very careful. And so this is something actually inherent to the uh, just the typical samples. There are iron-rich particles, I guess, you know, very small in the water. So, yeah, we have a scale bar here, so these are sub, you know, about a micron maybe. And uh, so we can characterize, but the nice thing about doing the synchrotron is that we can, with very uh, sophisticated image processing software, I said, I'm really worried about just the iron contained in the diatom. I may not care about these hot spots, these extra particles, and I can just integrate or look at, using the software, the iron in the diatom and look at these particles separately, and that's what we did. Because our ultimate goal is how much iron is being taken up by these diatoms? Is that a significant amount? What form is in the iron? Is this iron in the diatom? Is this iron a surface coating? And these are the, some of the problems I'll show you that we we're attempting to attack with the synchrotron. So here's the same diatom, just in boring old black and white that uh, was in a paper that Julia Diaz and me, uh, we published a while back in uh, Nature Communications. So we have our diatom, the silica channel, these hot spots, and um, here's a fragilariopsis. Again, diatom, but we see hot spots. Sometimes the hot spots are off the diatom, Sometimes they, you know, just fell. We also had some uh, silica flagellates, again, silica uh, containing uh, frustules. Sometimes we mapped a little coarser resolution just to get the basics. But, you know, silica and iron channels, you can clearly see that you get the same image, you know, uh, by looking at either element. Ah, so here's Julia. That's been a real, uh, you know, pioneer on this work, real good partner, and she's now at Skidaway. Uh, starting a faculty position. Here's a penguin for scale. So, um, <laughs> so, and this is one of those stories we were like, they let us, you know, and the boat stopped, and they said, okay, everybody can get off and walk on the ice if you want to, and we're like, oh man, we're in the Antarctic, and we haven't seen a single penguin, <laughs> and we're you know, kind of, uh, and this guy, you think there's nothing out there, and this guy just like, oh, what's that on the horizon? <laughs> and he just walked right up to us from nowhere and, you know, checked Julia out and said, you know, you're the a really weird looking penguin. Um, but anyways, um, we just decided to delve into where the iron was in these diatoms, what form it's in, because that's going to determine if it's a surface coating, if it's associated maybe with an organic surface coating. It's very likely to be remineralized very quickly in the surface water and recycled and reused, where if it's buried deep in the diatom frustral, then that may survive, and when the diatom is consumed by a myriad of organisms, it sinks down, and that can mean that iron is either remineralized at depth and could be entrained in a deep water mass, or it could be buried in sediments, taking the iron out of the system longer term. So we're going to use what we can from the synchrotron to determine where the iron was in the synchrotron. So the first thing we can do is <coughs> take the pixels that uh, define the diatom with our uh, fancy software uh, called MAPS, developed by a wonderful person at Argonne Lab, Stefan Vogt. And, um, and one of the things we noticed is uh, the, you know, taking here's three different diatoms. We just do the amount of iron per, it's a very unusual, you know, millimoles per cubic or per square centimeters so of image. And, you know, the actual thing is some atograms per square micron, but scaled up. Um, you can see that the iron and silicon are very well correlated in, you know, this diatom, this diatom, and we can put about another 50 up here. What that's telling us is where the diatom is thicker, and they're thick and thin areas, there's more iron. So thick, so which would suggest if it was just a uh, surface coating, then if silica went up, you would expect, well, you know, the iron would not uh, go up um, uh, in a corresponding way. And just think, well, okay, maybe this is something that's just inherent to all metals. So we did another metal um, in these plots, it's known to be surface-active manganese. 
looked at the manganese that we can determine from our synchrotron maps versus silicon. And, you know, here's the iron, here's the same manganese profile, and you can see just not nearly as correlated as the iron. So that was the first thing that suggested that this is not just some sort of surface coating. It's buried deep, potentially, within the diatom. So what is the form of iron within the diatoms? Here's a, just so it'd be nice to show you, you know, this, these brown ice, that's, that's diatoms living in the ice. We don't know where our diatoms ultimately came from. Some of them we did harvest directly from the ice, but the ones from the water, they could have been in ice just a while before. That's a lot of stuff that would be lovely to follow up. Is, is there something special about that ice environment in terms of iron cycling? But I just thought it'd be nice to show you the um, pretty picture showing you these you know, very distinctive round layers that are fairly common. So, <coughs> in uh, so one of the things is that we can do, this is from another study, but is once we identify um, uh, like one of those iron containing hot spots or just the general area of diatom, instead of mapping, we can just aim the beam, this highly focused x-ray beam at one particle, and we can vary the energy of the beam over a limited range. And what happens is at low energy, nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. And then you hit that sweet spot energy where there's enough energy in the beam to knock that case shell electron out. That's called the absorption edge. And then that's where the upper shell electrons drop down and give you a fluorescent signal. So this is that special thing. And then you keep doing and that electron that's ejected, it, it starts interacting with the uh, neighbors of that iron atom, nearest neighbors, second nearest neighbors, there's a lot of complex interactions. And a lot of those interactions generate subtle but diagnostic bumps and wiggles to, um, in the higher energy regions. And those can tell us something about the specific phase or form of iron present because we're getting information about neighbors and nearest neighbors. So. The other thing that's really awesome is that the uh, absorption edge, this sweet spot where the uh, electrons knocked out, is very sensitive to the oxidation state of iron. And we've done a lot of studies with other elements, sulfur, selenium, and that have uh, even more dramatic um, oxidation cycles. And there is a very, in the synchrotron world, this is big, a big shift in the position. So here's a spectrum for iron two. See, it's a little lower energy where that absorption edge occurs versus iron three. So we can distinguish the two. And there's a little feature here called the pre-edge centroid. And it's actually a fairly decent feature, but this, this other feature is so overwhelming that you don't see it. And this is actually a little bit more reliable, the position of that centroid, which is hard to see here in determining oxidation state. There have been studies on that. So got a nice edge shift. And if we blow up and do some uh, processing to kind of uh, flatten, you know, do a, a baseline correction and fit, you can, um, we can use this position of this pre-edge centroid here to get uh, a fix on the oxidation state of, of iron. So we can have, you can make, a, you know, elemental maps. Here's iron and aluminum, see if they're co-located. But over... Um, our work in, in aerosols and iron, we have developed databases of, of standard materials um, for iron. So I'll just show you, um, you know, various iron minerals, silicates, ox you know, organics, oxalates, sulfates, oxides, um, and, and such. And we can um, use these patterns, and you know, there, there are subtle differences, and we can use a database of these patterns to fit our unknown spectra to get an idea of, um, you know, the specific form of iron that's, that's present. All these databases um, we have made available to all um, in our papers as supplemental online materials. Um, and uh, you know, maybe, maybe not in the Antarctic paper, but in our, some of our aerosol papers so that other people can use them. Not as much of an issue for iron. People have published a little bit of databases, but for phosphorus, we have published uh, all our standards for people to use so they don't have to rerun stuff 
um, they can get on to the fun stuff at hand. So one of the things we did, and, and we, we, we did a lot of analyses, both looking at aiming the beam at just a thick spot in the diatom where there was a lot of iron, what's to do with spectro spectroscopy of the iron contained within the diatom, and spectroscopy of the hot spot iron. Are they different? And bottom line, here's a spectra of our iron incorporated in the frustral, and this dashed line is a fit using our database of standards. And the best we can say is that our iron incorporated in the frustral is mostly reduced and is best fit by mostly an organically bound iron with a little hint maybe of some iron oxyhydroxide. Whereas the hot spot iron, those particles that just appear in the samples, they've appeared in our samples, they've appeared in Ben Twining samples, is mostly just oxidized, you know, iron oxyhydroxides that uh, you typically see. So, um, and here is just that uh, a graph uh, or a, a histogram of the pre-edge centroid position um, showing you the position of a reduced iron would be over here and these uh, open squares are the um, uh, iron contained within the frustral and these are our hot spots and here's a iron, uh, oxidized iron standard. Bottom line, iron in the frustral seems to be more on the reduced end, distinctive relative to those hot spot particles. And this iron too also to me supports the idea that this iron is not just some surface coating, um, that it is deeply buried within the frustral protected from the oxidizing environment of the ocean. I think iron too just there as a, a surface coating in the diatom would be more or less rapidly oxidized to iron three. Um, so um, I don't know, did, did Carl Tariqin come up with the all you need is one data point and a good idea? So this is where we come from. You know, you got your, your one number, you got to extrapolate it. So like I said, we weren't going out there to do an iron study and uh, but we thought, well, what is the meaning of these numbers for the very poorly constrained iron budget of the Antarctic? So one of the things we still worry um, is, you know, in the iron business, contamination and all that sort of stuff, people worry a lot about. And, and people certainly, when they've looked at metals and metal uh, budgets associated with orga organisms all in the ocean, a very common practice is to do various chemical treatments to perhaps wash off surface coatings to, um, you know, I suppose if, if somehow um, things became. So what we did is we had, we took uh, some of our samples that were absolutely untreated, no chemical preservatives. I mean, all the samples we've done here um, were just taken out of the water and frozen. We, you know, Ben Twining uh, found out that a lot of the chemical pre preservatives like formalin and such that people commonly preserve their samples are full of trace metals and they have to be extensively clean. But these, so we had just had about a subset of about 50 samples which we found, okay, just untreated. Here's the molar iron to silicon ratio in those untreated samples. A very common treatment is a peroxide wash to, um, you know, in, in organisms. So we thought, well, let's just see, you know, what happens when we wash them. We lose a little bit of the iron. And then we got the trace metal clean hydrochloric acid, and we just went nuclear. We said, we're just going to wash the hell out of these things. So all that's remaining has got to be stuff that's really bound uh, cl closely with that diatom. So this is, uh, you know, some number of, I don't know, probably about 15, 16 diatoms that we washed in acid, then analyzed on the synchrotron. Very strong. I don't think anybody, and even the trace metal people, use that kind of. But this is the number we use. We said we want to be totally conservative. So this would be the best number of the iron really locked within the frustrals. And so there's, you know, a limited studies of people that have estimated silica fluxes from the water column there um, uh, down into the sediments and sediment burial rates. So we can take those estimates and an iron to silica ratio and start 
extrapolating wildly. And um, so you can see people have made estimates, highly constrained, of like what's the atmospheric deposition of iron to the Antarctic. So it only varies by a little bit more than an order of magnitude. Um, it's poorly constrained how much is coming in from above or how much is coming in associated in the ice, um, which I guess would be ultimately atmospheric or, you know, it could have a number. And certainly a big term in the iron budget is we have export of waters from the region, but there certainly has to be, has to be some, you know, upwelling to support the production. So there are waters that are coming up to the surface um, in these things. And the ship stopped at the very end of our science for the cruise in Apollonia, the open area of water right on the coast of Antarctic. I was stunned. You just look in the water and it's just so green and productive and you can smell the phaocystis, that sulfurous smell. I, I didn't quite expect that, but digression. We have numbers in this sort of range poorly constrained for the input from lateral advection, best we can estimate, from the literature, atmospheric deposition. And our conservative estimate of, di uh, of iron removal associated with diatom, I think the best we can say, it's a number on the same scale as these uh, potential inputs. So the bottom line is that these, this mechanism could remove a, a significant amount of iron from the water column um, in this region. And people now are discovering like all these hydrothermal systems, um, you know, in the shelf regions that can supply iron. So this number may be bigger and that would help us in that this is an extremely conservative estimate. But it's, it's a serious number. It's, it's big based on a very small number of samples, but you know, we've got to start somewhere. So this is the mystery. I'm not a biologist, and I don't really, you know, I'd like to think like a diatom, um, but why? This is an area that people constantly say, this is iron limited. And here you have this diatom, diatoms, taking up iron in an iron limited region. That seems just stupid. Um, why were they doing it? One of the things we speculated on is that perhaps um, the diatoms are taking up iron because somebody else needs that iron more to grow. So in a very simplistic thing, the two main organisms that people most often, I think, talk about in the Antarctic are the diatoms that make the silica frustral and more of just your uh, phaocystis algae that, you know, has no hard part, and at least what I can tell from the literature that the phaocystis may have a higher iron requirement. So if you're a diatom, maybe you can take up extra iron and keep it away from the phaocystis, thus, expend, uh, you know, extending your productive season and keeping somebody else from growing that needs it more. Pure speculation of why you would do such a, a silly thing in these region. So to conclude, I think based on our, our data set so far, where these diatoms have the potential to remove um, significant quantities of iron, um, it's probably locked in the frust, it, it looks like it's in deep in the frustral, so that can be transported to uh, deep waters. Um, certainly if we go back to the iron fertilization experiments, if you think about <coughs> those, well you add that iron, this could confound things because some of that iron is going into diatom frustrals and not towards direct production. <coughs> and this may be that idea of that we're having a competition of organisms and that may act to sort of shift these, uh, my, you know, uh, uh, populations, microbial populations from one to another with different iron requirements. And, you know, the other issue is the ice and the whole ice story down there is in a constant state of change and so we can see sometimes the diatoms are living in ice, there's open water species. We don't know, we didn't have enough samples to say ice bound versus open water have different iron uptake. If they do, then changing ice volumes could impact the iron system. So I think sort of more specific studies looking at, you know, diatoms more carefully sampled 
in environments would be a good idea. And of course, um, lots of acknowledgments from the, the Swedes, the National Science, Argonne, and lots of wonderful people that we got to uh, work with uh, on this opportunity. So there it is. Thank you. First hand went up in the back, so I'll, I'll first, first come, first serve. Yeah. yeah. So, so I was wondering if you had sampled diatoms away from the ice, if you see the same iron uptake, because I was just one, I this shows my ignorance and the fact that I haven't been paying attention to iron limitation in the Antarctic, but is it as limited by iron near the land as it is <coughs> off into the, you know, subtropical, I mean, the sub I, I would suspect it's you know when you're right near the land that it's it's probably much less limited, but we just don't have the, the sampling to do that. I mean certainly that polynia that was right off the land seems so productive that there's got to be a pl plenty of iron. But most of our sampling was it's fairly far off the coast in the middle of the ice, so but don't know. It's a good question. Jordan. So do you know that the iron is not in the membranes of the chloroplast? Can you say it louder, Gordon? Location of the iron is it only in the frustule or the membrane and the chloroplast? I would say um, that most of the um, you know we, we to look at membranes and chloroplasts um, is you know one has to be very uh, uh, careful in terms of the uh, preparation preservation of the sample um, and, you know because uh, those structures in just sort of a normal drying process just get torn out of the cell and, and, and compromised. So Ben Twining's work has looked more in, in, those fra in the organic fractions, but we're pretty much just focusing on um, the, the frustral itself. So we have no information on uh, of the, of that pool of iron, but that certainly Ben has shown that that contains significant iron, but we think that is stuff that's more likely to be uh, Faster cycled because it's you know in this nice juicy organic material. But yeah, but because all of these elect many electron carriers have uh, iron at their core. Right, and, and there are some studies that show that, you know maybe some of the process of silica de deposition involves iron containing molecules and other metal containing molecules. So maybe that's just the vestige of making a silica frustral. Yeah. Does anyone have data on diatoms? non-Arctic diatoms, because maybe this has something to do with the, um, you know, limits to photosynthesis or amount of light, and maybe, maybe this helps. Not much. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, something we've been thinking about. <laughs> so, um, does anybody look at the, uh, because you, you, you say that the, the iron in the first tool maybe to avoid competition with photosynthesis, uh, but maybe it's just because to from pathogens like bacteria in the middle, in the middle. That, Is anybody just... That, that, that sounds like an a, a intriguing idea as well. I, I, we, all we could do is speculate. I mean, we have no idea, but I mean, that why? But that, that's a good one. I mean, I like it. <laughs> Way in the back. <laughs> That's correct, yes. So there didn't seem to be too much correlation in the first two graphs between manganese and silica, but in the last graph, I think when the frustral was supposedly thicker, there seemed to be more of a correlation. A little bit, yeah. So it, did you notice that in other parts of the frustral, or was it? I, I think, you know, the iron was just so much more apparent, you know, when we just looked at maps and the manganese and that. But there may be, you know, since iron and manganese do often, you know, co occur go through some similarities in cycling, I would expect maybe a little bit, but it's certainly not, just not as uh, dramatic, in at least our opinion, as uh, the uh, iron. And of course, the iron is more, you know, that, that's what everybody is concerned about in the Antarctic and not uh, manganese. <coughs> yeah. So, um, a couple of things. There has been a hypothesis about iron-silica interactions in silicification for diatoms for a while. And I guess John Mock has suggested that there actually is a genomic evidence that there might be iron-containing proteins associated with silicification and that they might 
and they've done some experiments suggesting there is also iron incorporated into the fresh oil. And the argument is that that is actually iron associated with proteins mm -hmm. that get basically just intercalate, intercalated into the, into the silica rustule. So I don't know if you have to necessarily propose uh, a competition argument. There's actually might be a very direct physiological um, uh, uh, link between iron and silicification. And these guys in the Southern Ocean are really tend to be silicified because they're like little tanks mm -hmm. compared to the rest of the ocean. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is I think that if you look at the iron to silicon ratio, so you have that slide. Uh, up, yep. The actual number the conservative number was like 0.1, a little under 0.1, right? So that's on this challenge. Yeah. So I'd say silica, the people typically think it's equal molar with nitrogen. So you're looking at about a 10 micromole iron per mole carbon just in the rustule, which is about what people typically assume for the protoplasm in these, in these waters. That would suggest to me this is a pretty iron-rich uh, culture. I mean, I think your numbers are right, but I would I would be surprised if that you get a number like that. We didn't see when we measured these things in the Antarctic. We didn't see numbers close to that in the uh, frustules out in the open ocean um, near the Antarctic front. So I think. I think that's probably an indication this is pretty rich iron region, which is fine. I mean, because it still represents a barrier that's preventing that iron from, from moving out. and it's moving it downwards. So I think that's really the kind of cool thing is that you have this uncontrolled uptake of iron right at the point when it could actually transition out to the ocean. It's probably exacerbating. And I think um, it gets to. Josie's question, you know, like looking at other areas, and I, yeah, I know there's yeah, a little bit in the uh, circumpolar, you know, yeah, that is this iron uptake just an inherent thing that, of, of things that diatoms do to have a silica uh, frustral, and that's what, it, and does that uptake vary depending on how robust the frustrals are or some other environmental parameter? But, right, right. Yeah. So you started, up, uh, started with a, with a frustral and then you diatoms go into the krill and there are the whales also. And what would you think, what is happening with this iron during uh, while well, well, it's going through the food web? You had the chance to take some whale poop. So what would you expect <laughs> in there? Is, 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 is the iron then still somehow closely incorporated in the brush shoes or? I, I don't really, no, well, then it's kind of several. So I was wondering, what would come from the food web? Well, I mean, you know, they certainly know that um, the frustrals as they're moving down the water column, and that usually, you know, often that's occurring in some sort of packaging, whether it's in uh, whale turd or uh, other mechanisms. Um, uh, they, you know, there is dissolution within the water column. That's that's quite clear. So, um, but you know, I guess you know, the, you know, we do know that the uh, sediments there are rich uh, in, and of course, uh, silicon. Uh, you know. Uh, material like that. So some of it does make it through the water column. And if the iron is sort of just generally incorporated through the uh, diatom and whatever gets then buried in the sediments is taking some portion of the iron uh, that survives water column transport out. And some portion of the iron is regenerated within the water column and can come back up or be exported out depending on the physical oceanography. Well, uh, I was I did forget to mention that Ellery was a student of Robert Berner. I mentioned that yesterday, but I forgot to mention it today uh, explicitly. So uh, he's very much steeped in that area of uh, sedimentary processes in addition to these water column processes. So those of you who will be joining him for lunch now uh, can pursue any number of topics <laughs> that uh, feel free to do it. And obviously, he's willing to expound on virtually anything. So thanks it's so much. Getting me to stop, though. Thank you.
prolactin production. And so somehow that protein's in there. But in Nichols' case, it's not a living thing, right? Probably not. No, it's Hardly not. The whole world over. Yeah. It's basically Probably always not. like a tuna. It's <laughs> probably I can tell you just say like tuna animal. <laughs> and you don't need that. And you don't need that <laughs> and much. And it's not bound. And you don't need that much nickel. Nobody needs that much. And nobody needs that much. And it's, right. it's not, that's why it's, it's relatively a lot of it. But, um, but iron, we saw relatively little of. Huh. Um, we, you know, it's hot spots. I mean, he sees the hot spots as like spots against the skin. Yeah. Our hot spots are like, there's yeah. nothing else there. Those are, <laughs> there's nothing there. Those are like, those are like just little. Yeah, the little oxy hydroxide yeah. things. But the, it's the relative signal you get. Yeah. And our samples compared to his that suggested well, that's got to be a really high concentration. Huh. And his photos and his are. There's some. 